Hello, my name is Russell and today on Gaming Rules I'll be previewing the game Hyobi Dragons Into the Unknown, designed by Kim Arberic and Kim Jansson and due to be published by Toadies Design who sponsored this video. On one of the world's oldest known terrestrial globes, an inscription was written that said Hik Sun Draconis, or Hyobi Dragons. In this adventure game, players become bold explorers, uncovering a new land in pursuit of fortune, influence and terrible foes. Your goal is to accumulate a winning number of victory points before your opponents can. Let's begin by showing you how to set up the game. Take the deck of event cards indicated by this illustration on the back, and create separate piles for the corrupted cards that look like this, and the ones that have an eye symbol on the front. The remaining cards, which have a bag symbol on, will be shuffled, and you will then take a number of these cards depending on the number of players, putting them aside, and placing the remaining ones into the game box as these will not be used. Leaving the corrupted cards aside, you can now shuffle all the other event cards together to create the event deck. Now split the event deck in half, and shuffle the corruption cards into the bottom half, adding the untouched half back on top. Also place the dragon figure and the boss card, face down, somewhere nearby. This will be revealed later. Split the monster card, represented by this symbol, into three separate piles by the monster level on the rear side of the cards. Shuffle them separately, then place each deck somewhere on the table. Hand each player the following components. One double-sided village and town tile. One double-sided fort and citadel tile. 17 cubes, a travel marker and a character meeple in their chosen colour. One tech tree board, and two attack dice. Using their own cubes, players set their score tracker on the bottom of the player board as follows. 0 victory points, 0 gold, 0 resources, 2 influence, and 10 health. Then place 2 other cubes underneath their tech tree, ready to track any upgrades they acquire during the game. Choose a first player by deciding who would make the greediest dragon, or by a method of your own choosing. Take the starting tile, indicated by the boat symbol on the front side, and place it in the middle of the play area. Each player places their character token on this tile. The remaining tiles should all be in the bag. Finally, each player now chooses one of the six directions from the starting tile to explore first by placing their travel marker down on the empty adjacent spot. Now you're ready to begin. This game features a mix of mechanics such as hexagon grid, map addition, income, action points, tech trees, and dice rolling. Here I'll explain a little about how each of these work as well as how they feature in this game. These two mechanics are inexorably linked in many board games. Hexagon Grid is the mechanism in which six-sided tiles are used in the game, usually in the form of an explorable map or movement-based system, while Map Edition is the mechanism in which a map is added to as part of the gameplay. Hyobi Dragons Into the Unknown uses the two together, as the game is played out on a map that starts off as just one tile, but expands during the game as players move around and explore. Their tiles in this game are double-sided, and the front contains one of several terrain types. There are forests, mountains, plains, and water, as well as a special type of tile called the Dungeon 2, and each one offers different possibilities for the player that lands on it. Plain tiles can contain farms which produce resources, watchtowers which reveal their surrounding areas, and sanctuaries which produce influence points as well as potential healing, and are a place to respawn if you lose all your health in battle. Forests and mountains can contain sawmills or mines, which produce resources, but can also be searched to find monsters. We'll talk all about fighting those troublesome beasts a little later in the video. Water tiles can contain harbours represented by anchor symbols, which are the only method of entering water tiles and exploring beyond them. Special tiles contain dungeons, which house an increasingly dangerous selection of three monsters for you to take on, if you dare. On the back of each tile is a corrupted land, and this will come into play when the game's boss, the Devourer, is awakened, as they will start causing corruption to spread across the land, changing the gameplay as a result, the details of which are explored towards the end of this preview. Movement is a main factor in getting to explore the map, and is planned at the end of your turn by placing your travel marker onto an allowed space. Usually this is one space away, but you can get up to 3 bonus movement if it's used to move through all planes or all water tiles before making your final move to a new terrain or space. Income might be more familiar to you as engine building, and is essentially a mechanism in which players can increase the amount of goods they receive each round by improving or expanding their starting setup. 
In this game, you start off with nothing except a little bit of influence. But on your turn, you can establish a settlement and then spend your gold, resources and influence to upgrade it, as well as create production buildings, which generate extra income for you every time it's your go. This is done by placing district cubes onto the map, which cost two resources apiece. You can add cubes to unoccupied tiles anywhere you like, even if your character token is elsewhere. When placed adjacent to your other cubes, they can improve your income by activating production sites like mines and farms. The more district cubes you place, the better your settlement grows too, and you'll be rewarded with extra gold and even victory points by doing so. However, other players will be vying to use the map's limited space and assets as well as placing their own cubes, and it is only through item cards, monster tokens, or corruption that they can be removed. District cubes can also create opportunities for you and obstruction for others, as moving into an opponent's district requires a payment to that player of one gold, which covers you until you move out of that player's districts. Without gold, however, you will not be allowed to enter, which makes for a much trickier time moving around the map. Action points is a mechanic in which players use their turn to perform a number of actions, usually with a limit of some kind. In this game, players can play multiple item cards from their hand, but searching for monsters can only be done once per turn, and only on certain tiles that allow it. Upgrading or building a settlement, as well as placing district cubes can be done multiple times, but only on spaces where no other players have presence, and require spending resources which are themselves limited. Tech trees are all about choices with branching outcomes or upgrades, allowing players to have an element of control over their situation by selecting their own path that they hope will see them victorious. Here, this comes in the form of a literal tree on the upper half of your player board. There are four branches, but you can only move along two of them at a time. One of these must be gear, but the other can move down any of the remaining three, all offering their own weapon types that improve your strength in battle, with unique advantages or increased strength when fighting certain enemy types. These are all upgraded by spending the required gold, and the further along them you go, the better they become. The flintlock, for example, allows you to re-roll dice during battle, while the ice staff prevents enemies from using their traits, which could both swing the tide of battle in your favour. Dice rolling is a fairly straightforward mechanic which involves, you guessed it, rolling dice. And in Herbie Dragons Into the Unknown, this is utilised for three purposes. One is to search for monsters, where only a result of three or higher will find one for you to fight. Fleeing from these encounters is the second use, and requires a result of four or higher in order to escape. Finally, there is fighting, and battles here are reminiscent of games like Risk, with multiple dice used to face off against one another. Battles will usually occur between players and monsters, with rewards gained for defeating them, but players who share the same space on the map can also battle each other too, so long as they have two influence to lose for this morally bad action. The attacking player can only initiate if they have less points than the defender, but no matter who starts it, the victor will steal two victory points from the loser, meaning that this is ultimately a way to stop someone from winning, but could accelerate things toward that outcome too. Thankfully, battles are simple but tense. The number of dice rolled by a player is determined by their strength, which is improved by their tech tree progress as well as from item cards played during battle. For monsters, their cards will reveal not only their strength, but also any special rules during the fight. All dice are rolled together in a round of battle, and the player's dice are then ranked and compared with the opposing player's dice, with all unpaired dice ignored. Higher results beat lower ones, and count as a hit, while even results are considered a draw and are not removed. As long as each side has at least one die remaining after a round of battle, it continues with all remaining dice. This carries on until one player loses all their dice, in which case the battle ends and any rewards are gained. When fighting, unsuccessful battles will result in the player losing a number of health points equal to the monster's original strength. If a player loses all their health points, they will remove their character token from the board, as well as lose all event cards, gold and resources, and level one step down on a branch of their tech tree. They are not out, however, as during their next turn, they will revive at the nearest sanctuary with full health, ready to fight again. We've covered most of the major mechanics, but one of the big elements we haven't detailed yet involves the game's boss. In Herby Dragon Into the Unknown's base game, players will face the Devourer, a tough to defeat dragon who will appear and awaken 
through the game's corruption cards. During each player's turn, immediately after moving their character meeple to their new destination, they'll draw a card from the event deck. These are usually positive things like items and quests, but as the game progresses you'll start drawing nasty corruption cards. Not only do these hurt the player, but when the third corruption card is revealed, the Devourer awakens, is placed on the starting tile which becomes corrupted, and its card is revealed to all. The event deck, including all discarded cards, is now shuffled again. From that point on, whenever a corruption card is drawn, the Devourer will corrupt all the land adjacent to existing corrupted tiles, and everything except character tokens are removed from those tiles. Players in those spots lose one health, which also happens whenever a player ends their turn on a corrupted tile. This also works as a countdown timer for the game, as after the 8th and final corruption card has been drawn, players have one more turn each to try defeating the Devourer in battle, or the game is over and the Devourer wins. That's not all though, as any players defeated by the Devourer become corrupted, now working for and winning alongside their new Draconic Lord. Their new objective is to gain 10 victory points by stealing them from other players or gaining them by defeating monsters. In a horrible twist, any non-corrupted players they eliminate also become corrupted. This adds an interesting aspect to the game, in which objectives and alliances constantly shift, but also still leaving you with an option to win, even if you lose against the game's boss. Of course, there are many ways to win the game, and completing quests is one of them. These varied objectives are shuffled into the event deck, and immediately revealed to all players after being drawn, offering big rewards to the first person to complete them, including, most importantly, victory points. They are a simple but effective way to mix up the game and encourage otherwise unlikely actions, like exploring far out to sea or chasing down a specific type of monster. Sure, defeating the Devourer is what the game is pushing you towards, but by seeking to fulfil quests, you might not even need to step foot near the big boss. The game includes a solo mode, which plays almost identically to the main game, except with no player-on-player -player battles. Your goal is still to defeat the Devourer or gain 10 victory points before all of the corrupted cards have been drawn. It's a nice option to include, particularly because it doesn't involve having to learn a whole new set of rules, giving the game more flexibility in your collection. The game's artwork has a real old school Dungeons and Dragons type of vibe, with illustrations looking like they were taken straight from a tome of creatures unearthed from the past and would definitely feel nostalgic to a particular set of players. The user interface is clear too with unique iconography for many of the game's elements, and bold keywords on cards and text highlighting important bits, though it is important to note that this is a prototype copy of the game, and everything, including the rules, are subject to change before the game's final release. This is a traditional adventure-style exploration game that takes a familiar set of rules and mechanisms and combines them into a fun replayable bundle with enough variables to make the game unique every time you play. Players will enjoy discovering different combinations of items on their tech tree, and also alternative ways to victory, whether that's taking on the big bad, uh, generating big income engines, or simply getting in your friend's way. The game plays between one and six players, and takes about one to four hours to play, with higher player counts stretching out the experience. Here Be Dragons Into the Unknown is currently on Kickstarter as of this video's premiere, and is due to be released sometime in 2021 at a cost of 399 Swedish kroner, which is around about 35 British pounds. If you have any questions, please drop a comment below and I will do my best to answer them. Thanks for watching this preview. I've created this video for gaming rules and if you haven't subscribed already, you can do so by clicking the subscribe button below this video. I'd also encourage you to check out their channel as there are plenty more videos for you to watch, including more previews, reviews and playthroughs. I also have my own channels under the name Fidgets and Giggles. And if you're interested in those or like to check out more, please use the details on screen. Hope you've enjoyed this video, but that is all from me. My name has been Russell, take care and thanks for watching. Proudly sponsored by Game Toppers, upgrading your gaming experience. Visit GameToppersLLC.com.